Hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk coming to you from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC, also streaming on the iHeart and the iTunes app. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So hi there, my name is, you got it, Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This all depends on when you are listening or joining us. So welcome, welcome so much. I'd like to uh, share our conversation today on uh, both about the recent passing of three famous Jewish persons, and then speak about the lessons from the persons who won the Powerball and the Mega Millions. And if time allows us, we'll talk a little bit about the hand-warming story of how Bernie Sanders got his inauguration mittens. And I know that uh, for sure everybody's been focused on his mittens. And um, I just wanted to know that what I like about glove uh, or glove jokes is that they always come in handy. And so I will share with you some of those insights that um, the Bernie, uh, Bernie Sanders has uh, brought to my attention. And the truth is I, I, I bought some textures uh, gloves earlier, uh, but I got a little bit of uh, blue paint on them. I guess you could say I'm feeling a little blue. So let's get to our subject here, and because I know what you get for pay, uh, you get what you pay for, and uh, my uh, humor isn't uh, of the highest caliber. So let's talk about these three famous personalities. Three famous American Jews passed away in the past months. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She passed away on Rosh Hashanah Eve. Also, uh, recently was the famous Jewish philanthropist Sheldon Adelson. And of course, Larry King, the famous media host, and he passed away just this week. So I want to share with you today, what is the common denominator between the three of them and what we can learn from that? Interesting, they all lived to the age of, you got it, 87. However, if you look a little closer to their lives, you will find they have much more in common than simply the same age that they passed away. When um, RBG died, the Guardian published an article claiming that at the age of 17, she abandoned her religion. There was an immediate uproar, and many people were furious about this claim, saying that in fact she was a a proud Jew. A large silver mezuzah hung on the door of her chambers in the Supreme Court, and she was known to have stopped court proceedings during the high holidays. The newspaper soon apologized and corrected their statement. Though the justice had moved away from observance, nevertheless, she remained deeply committed to her Jewish identity. And recently, it became clear that even that wasn't completely true. She was born in Brooklyn to a traditional family. Her mother would light Shabbat candles and before Passover would clean out the entire house and bring in a new set of Passover dishes. They belonged to the local synagogue where she studied in Hebrew school and attended a Jewish summer camp. As she got older, she became a counselor at the Jewish camp and the campus actually dubbed her rabbi. Why? Because she would deliver the sermon every Shabbos. However, her mother passed away when she was 17 years old and she slowly drifted away from the observance and devoted her life to her career. Well, many years later, in the year 2003, Rabbi Nossin Gurari, who was the Chabad emissary in Buffalo, met with Justin Anthony Scalia in his office for some matter. Justin Scalia was not Jewish, but he showed great interest in Judaism, and he introduced the rabbi to the two Jewish justices, Stephen Breyer and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. He had a pleasant meeting with RBG, and she welcomed him into her chambers, and she also made sure to point out the mezuzah on her door. She soon... This rabbi soon developed a warm relationship with her. Each holiday, he would bring her a holiday gift. Matzah before Passover, Shalachmonis before Purim, and so on. She would always reply on a handwritten note on the Supreme Court letter, her, where she shared her warm sentiments for Jewish tradition. One time after receiving the matzah, she wrote back, World's best matzahs arrived in good time for Passover. I will bring one box to the family Seder. It is a time that revives memories of the seders at my grandparents' home and of the dishes my mother brought up every year. They were my favorites. One Hanukkah, she wrote to the rabbi, my mother would smile to think of me lighting candles and saying the brucha. 
something she made very special in her home. Hanukkah was a happy time for us, not the least, of course, when she received a Hanukkah gelt from her grandfather. After her husband's death in 2010, she began speaking to Jewish audiences more frequently in the United States and in Israel, and she often spoke about the importance of tradition in her own life. So that was RBG. Let's now move on to Larry King, who passed away this week, and he called himself an agnostic. However, he had a warm relationship with, with Rabbi Kuhn, the Chabad rabbi of California, and for several years he actually chaired the Chabad Talathon, and he put on tefillin there several times. In connection to Chabad, um, started actually much earlier. Larry, like RBG, was born to a Jewish family in Brooklyn. They were Orthodox. When he was nine years old, his father died, and his mother was so poor, she didn't have money to buy his glasses. He related that someone from Chabad bought him the glasses that he needed. He deeply loved Jewish holidays. Passover, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur were serious days for him. After visiting Israel, he spoke about the wonderful feeling when visiting Jerusalem. Though he wasn't an observant Jew, he never mixed milk and meat. In his childhood home, they kept kosher, and he would never able to bring himself to break that tradition. Now, let's move on now. Um, the third person we're speaking about is Sheldon Adelson. Unfortunately, he was not born in Brooklyn. He was born in Boston. At least they started off with a B, in a very Jewish neighborhood. In 1990, he met his wife, Miriam, who is Israeli, and, they did, and, he, and then he rediscovered his Jewish origins. At the time of his engagement, he had a relationship with a Chabad rabbi, Alta Bukit. One day, Rabbi Bukit called him up, and he wanted to give Sheldon and Miriam a wedding present. This wedding present, but on one condition, that Sheldon agreed to accept it before he finds out what it is. At the end, he agreed. And the rabbi said he would take them to New York to receive a blessing from the Rebbe before their wedding. Two weeks before their wedding, in the summer of 1991, they flew to New York. During the flight, Sheldon commented that he didn't understand why he was flying all the way to New York for a meeting that could last just a few seconds. In the end, they arrived at seven seventy for dollars, and the Rebbe blessed them warmly in honor of their wedding. His bride, Miriam, asked the Rebbe for an additional blessing for a child. Why only one child, the Rebbe commented. A, ch a child should have a brother and a sister too. At the time, Mrs. Adelson was 46. Several years later, when she was 51, she gave birth to her first son, Adam. And two years later, she gave birth to her second son, Matan. Now, Rabbi Shir Halek, the Chabad Shlich of Las, Las Vegas, related that they always thanked the Rebbe for the blessing. Now, in the, if, in the years followed, he became one of the greatest uh, philanthropists and, of course, uh, supported the Chabad School in Las Vegas and the Yad Vashem. And he gave lots of uh, support to Birthright, which brings youngsters to Israel. And recently, when he passed away, he asked to be buried in the most traditional form in a modest grave on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Now, I bring this all up to you, dear friends, because there's a deep, I guess, uh, denominator between these three people, in that they tell the story of the Jewish people in the past generation. It doesn't matter who they are and what their level of observance is, deep in their heart is a profound connection with God and Jewish tradition. Now, we read in this Torah portion about the splitting of the sea and about the song the Israelites sang afterwards. Right afterwards, the Torah relates that we traveled for three days in the desert and didn't find water. When they finally reached a body of water, it turned out to be bitter. They began to complain. <laughs> what are we going to drink? Moses cried out to Hashem. God told him, take a piece of wood and throw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Then a month later, after their exodus from Egypt, they ran out of matzah, and, which they had brought out from uh, Egypt. Again, they complained. What do we eat now? I said, don't worry, about, don't worry about it. You're going to have bread from heaven, the famous man. So that issue was resolved. Not long afterwards, the Israelites reached Rephidim. Again, there was no water to drink. And the game became ups upset with Moshe. Give us the drink. Why do you take us out of Egypt, right? Why should... You know, and, and Moshe, of course, uh, Moses went to Hashem and said, well, what am I going to do with these people? They're going to soon stone me. This was, all, this was already the third crisis, and Moses was afraid that this was a boiling point. But again, God said to Moshe, walk before them, 
take it easy, go and take your stick and hit a rock. And, and of course, we all know the water began to flow. Now, what does it mean to walk before the nation? And Rashi explains, walk before, and you'll see that no one's going to stone you. These are, my, these are my children. They will never do such a thing. Deep in their hearts, they love you and they want to do the right thing. So even though they were complaining and kvetching, God reassured Moshe, don't worry, deep down. And that's why I share this with you about these three Jewish persons, RBG, Sheldon Adelson, and Larry King. This was a, a, a demonstration of what the Rebbe would always repeat, that within each and every one of us, there's a treasure, a true faith in Hashem. We just need to help that person uncover the treasure within themselves. And when we help others strengthen their connection, we come out stronger and more connected to, to God ourselves. The power of appreciating, not judging someone, but remember, each of us have that power inside of us. Now moving to my uh, th- uh, second subject, is I, um, I'm sure you know, last week, within a span of a f- just a few days, two individuals became extraordinarily wealthy in an instant. There was this Powerball ticket holder in Maryland who won $731 million, the jackpot. And the Mega Millions ticket holder in Michigan was the winner of $1.05 billion. Now, while they may seem like a dream come true, winning instant wealth overnight in a public way can come with many challenges including, of course, the loss of anonymity, frivolous lawsuits, addiction, divorce, bankruptcy, and sadly, I know even of people who've passed away who, one, just couldn't handle it. Now, I'm fully aware that most people would welcome the test and take their chances, but what I want to share with you, I want to, it's worth pointing out that there is another type of wealth and another way to accumulate it that comes with a a lot less risk or danger. I want to tell you a story. For 50 years, there was a certain individual called Moshe Brookstein who lived in Bushtano. This was a, a town in Hungary. Now it's called Ukraine. And he lived with great honor and prominence. His family were familiar with the story of his successful business, his role in the community, and how it was and uh, they had lost it all during the war. However... It was only recently when someone shared a book about the Jewish community of Marmarush in Romania where it was discovered what in fact made this particular Moshe Brookstein wealthy and, success, and, and with success. It's a story worth listening to and uh, reminding us as well. Now this person's father was... Um, was the Rebbe of a, a leader of, of a town and the author of some very important um, uh, books, Jewish books. His grandfather, Chaim Yosef, was a close Chassid, follower of the Baal Shem Tov. A close, he was also a close friend of the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, and the Shpala Zeda. So he, he was uh, very connected to very holy people of his time. This is Moshe's father. Now, Moshe himself was a loyal follower and he frequented the tables of the and the studying with great Hasidic masters. Now, this town where he was, Boshjano, was near a forest. And this Moshe had a lumber business. And he provided for his family, but wasn't particularly lucrative. One Shabbos, Moshe's wife, that means his wife, had the great honor of providing kugel special kugel for the Nadvorna Rebbe. And um, at, 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 the, at the particular Friday night, this is in the Hasidic communities, not so much in Chabad, in other communities, Friday night is reserved for a tish, a special, everybody comes together in the synagogue and the Rebbe learns and the sings and it's a, it's a very uplifting experience. Now, it's the custom that the Rebbe enjoys, he, when the kugel is brought in, the Rebbe, the leader, takes a small portion of the kugel then he immediately distributes the rest to, to everybody there, eager to taste from, from this kugel. 
is considered a very blessed food because it's the holy leftovers of the Rebbe. By the time Reb Moshe, this person who was there, got to the tray, all that was left over from the kugel was scraps and crumbs. The Rebbe, sensing the disappointment and frustration of his chassid, turned to Reb Moshe with a big smile and says, don't worry about it. From the shards of the broken luchos, Moshe Rabbeinu became very wealthy. As you all know, when Moses smashed the first tablets, he didn't throw everything away. He was allowed to keep keep uh, the piece, uh, some of the pieces, and the or, or, excuse me, excuse me, the the uh, you know when when it was chopped up, and, and and he had to make the second set. There was actually um, pieces, little, little shards, and. Moshe was told, you, you, that belongs to you. And there were sapphire and all kinds of precious stones. Ended up making him very wealthy, just from little pieces. So Moshe Brookstein didn't understand the reference. Why was this Rebbe saying to him, don't worry. You know, telling him, you, you've just gotten some leftover uh, of the kugel. And telling him, don't worry, that uh, the fa- famous Moshe Rabbeinu became wealthy with little pieces. Didn't understand that. But he enjoyed the rest of the Shabbos. And the following week, he went back to work back to the lumberyard. Just a few days later, he noticed something. When the large trees were chopped down and cut into lumber, small pieces of wood were regularly discarded as worthless scraps. He took a closer look at them and realized that while these small pieces weren't useful for construction or even for firewood, they were perfect for something else. At the time, canes, walking canes and walking sticks, weren't just for the elderly or the infirm. They were trendy among people of all ages Particularly, right, we all know stories of, of yesteryear people walking around, the wealthy people and aristocratic people walking around with walking sticks. Immediately, he opened up a factory to transform the discarded scraps from lumber yards into canes and walking sticks and in a short time became one of the largest distributor across Europe. After the World War I ended, his business sold hundreds of thousands of canes and crutches to those injured in the war. So the subtle blessing of the Rebbe came true from the scraps. He became successful. Now, there's something to learn from this. Yes, some become extraordinarily wealthy by making a lot of money overnight, like the people who win the lottery. Others gain wealth by collecting the small, seemingly insignificant, inconsequential things, moments and experiences that others are prepared to discard and throw away, and not even put one's mind to it. And I want to share with you what I think is significant of how to become wealthy. Because I know a person who keeps a notebook for each of his children. From when they first begin to speak, he writes down and collects the most adorable, witty, and insightful things they have said. At each of their bar and bat mitzvahs, and late at their weddings, he pulls out this book with a mix of nachas, emotion, and nostalgia, and he shares things that he has collected from them throughout the years. When he wants to reflect on his wealth, quote-unquote, he doesn't look at his financial statements or holdings. He simply opens up one of these notebooks and starts to read. While the likelihood of winning the lottery is exceedingly small, (laughs) as we all say and know, there is a greater chance of getting hit by lightning twice on the same day, We can become very wealthy, if not overnight, over time. And for many, this year has been very financially challenging, draining savings and depleting hard-earned monies. For many, it has been emotionally exhausting, depriving us of many things that we're looking forward to or previously took for granted. And yet, in other ways, it has been rich with opportunity to remember the difference between what is essential and unessential, and to be grateful for what, which, uh, for that which we most often have taken for granted. How many moments, experiences, people, and things have we discussed and discarded as insignificant? How many cute or witty lines did we hear from a child we would not have heard had we not been spending more time at home? How many opportunities have we had to participate in something online, whether it was a class, a concert, an out-of-town relative's, Graduations, I've, thank God, participated in two brisson of two grandchildren, one in Toronto, one in Florida during this COVID period, through the Zoom. You know, um, 
Imagine the savings we could say we can accumulate by taking note, either in a journal or on an app, or the minimum, sp- just spending a reflective moment at the end of the day of something meaningful, something enjoyable, however small it may seem that it happened to us that day. So let's take the time to think and reflect and recognize that if we only held on to that which we previously discarded, just like Moshe Brookstein in the story, who noticed how scraps are just lying around, scraps of wood, and he turned it into a tremendous business, we too can find lots of nachas from the small little things that we think are just to be discarded, like, all right, a little child saying something or someone doing something nice to us. They end up being from the scraps or little things that we tend to forget turn out to be amazing, amazing source of, of, uh, of blessing. And I do appreciate, I appreciate the, the feedback and the comments, the people I meet on the street who uh, listen to our program here every week and uh, share their thoughts and their comments. And I do appreciate that, really, really. It's, it's really, really heartwarming. And I, these are the small things in life that make a difference. Now, you all know, moving on to my third topic for today, we all know of the, uh, what happened when um, Bernie Sanders, the uh, congressman, or the senator, I should say, um, from Vermont, was uh, caught on camera sitting there wearing this beige parka. And his legs and arms were crossed, and he's socially distancing. And he was hugging his hands with a pair of large mittens bearing a white and brown pattern. They looked soft. They looked warm. And uh, he, this is one of the most, I guess, one of the historic moments or images during the inauguration of the 46th president, President Joe Biden, that has, uh, ha- will have a long-lasting effect. And uh, it went viral. And I'm sure you all know of the many memes and all the other people of fun, etc., uh, with Bernie with his uh, mittens. In fact, the one who actually made it, made them, um, eventually, this lady, I think her name is Joe Ellis, Joe Ellis, she um, made some more, Jen Ellis, she's actually a second grade teacher who lives in Essex Junction in Vermont. She made three more and auctioned them off and a lot of money was actually say, uh, raised for charity. Just wonderful. So, um, it's, uh, it's fascinating. And of course, the Baal Shem Tov says, whatever you see and hear, you can use in the service of, of Hashem. So I started to think about mittens, gloves, gloves, mittens, although they may not be the same, but um, the importance uh, of knowing, uh, thinking about the hands inside the mittens or the gloves. Um, you know, it, it is important to, to, um, to share the importance of that. Uh, when people saw the picture of uh, Bernie, it was glove... <laughs> at first sight. Now, I want to tell you, if I get a message on my phone after midnight, I always assume it's about disposable gloves. You know why? Because it's a latex. Latex. Okay. All right. Please. Uh, I was told not to make too many jokes because it actually disturbs the, um, the transmission. But I do want to say one, one thing. Um, there, there were a lot of complaints about gloves not fitting in general. And the truth is, when I hear these things and people call me about it, I say it's really getting out of hand. So, again, uh, as important as the gloves are, I just want to point out the significance of one's hands in Jewish life. Um, there's so much, so many rituals and importance of washing one's hands. For example, when we uh, before we eat, sit down to a meal with bread, we wash our hands and actually make a blessing. Uh, there's a full blessing that we make called Natilas Yadayim. Baruch ato Hashem alakeinu melech elom Hashem kadoshanu b'mesayim b'sivanu al natilas yadayim. Our hands are very involved. For example, when we first wake up in the morning, there's a ritual called nagelvasa. It's rooted in, the, in knowing it's in the that when we are asleep, a certain impurity comes over us, and um, so typically, when we, as soon as we wake up, even before we take a walk to the bathroom, wherever, we take we pick up a two handled cup. And we wash our hands. And of course, we uh, we say the Maida'ani beforehand. So we wash our hands before we eat. We wash our hands 
Of course, you could not wear gloves or mittens be between either of them. So we wash our hands before we eat. We wash our hands when we wake up in the morning. We, the, of course, there's even those who wash their hands after the, at the end of the meal. It's called Maya Machronim. A little, little dab of water is had uh, to wipe away any salt, etc. It's called Maya Machronim. And it's called afterwards water. Then, of course, do you know that in the synagogue, before the priest, the Kohen, blesses us, those who go with him and wash his hands. So, again, washing of the hands for the priestly blessing. We all remember how we wash our hands a number of times uh, during the Passover Seder. And on the sadder side of life, when we leave, when we go to visit a loved one, we go to a funeral, when we return from a cemetery, of course, um, we also wash our hands to make a difference between the boundary of living and those who are have passed away. And of course, no blessing is said during that time. Now, there's another area which I can't go into great great detail today, as time is of the essence, but I'm very interested in graphology. You know that uh, I like the study of hands. Not, nothing to do with the future, but to, you can actually judge a person's character by their hands. Um, it's, uh, I guess the term used is graphologists, because, you know, uh, one's hands reveal an extension of one's personality, and, um, and th- then even more than our handwriting. Uh, the the uh, Many times, uh, I know people who do it as an icebreaker, when they get around the table, they ask everyone to show them their hands, and the person is able to look at them and, and kind of uh, share with them what their uh, kind of character is all about. And this is something in future programs we'll go into, some of the signs to look out at one's hands. We all know throughout the temple, hands were used in, in, in different ceremonies, and... Um, both hands with the transference of, 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 of uh, leadership from one role to the other. We find that when Moses, when Moses transferred his leadership to Joshua, he laid his hands on him. It's a, a, from master to disciple. And that's what he did prior to his passing away. He conferred his leadership upon Joshua. And he did that by placing both of his hands upon him. And that's right in the Torah. So you see, hands are very important. And just, just to conclude... In the Jewish tradition, when we cut our nails on our hands, we don't cut them, uh, you know, one after each other. Let's say from the, you know, the thumb to the index, just in, like an, in an order, in an orderly fashion, one, two, three, four, five. But you actually skip out. So you would start off with the index, then you skip, go to the go to the to the uh, to the right. You do the next one, and then you go back. Bottom line is, you don't cut the nails of one's um, uh, of one's feet. And of one's hands in, in a in a in the straight order. It's always you always mix you miss one out. You jump one, and the reason is because, at the end of a person's life, when they're prepared for the burial, they actually clean the nails and they do it in a in a one two three four order. So not not to uh, be associated with anything that, but associated with life, it is done in that manner. So. Enough with all the uh, all of this. Hashem, the Almighty God, you blesses with health and good a good week. And wishing you a good week. And uh, if you have a pair of gloves, wear them because it's cold out there. Have a wonderful week. Thank you so much.